Welcome to the 81st Annual Cold Spring Harbour Laboratory Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year's topic is on targeting cancer and I am Gemma Alderson with Nature Reviews Cancer and I'm sitting here today with Gigi Lozano from MD Anderson Cancer Centre. So Gigi, thank you for coming. Thank you um, for inviting me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And um, I, uh, I guess you're, you haven't spoken yet at the meeting, but I Correct. guess we're going to talk about P50, P53 yes. and mutations of P53. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you give us a bit of background about kind of where we're at in the field and kind of what's happening? Well, I think um, all the new sequencing, next generation sequencing data that has um, has, de has been uh, developed over the last few years has basically said that P53 is mutant in almost any cancer that you can think of. Right. Um, and we've been working with the P53 mutation in animal models, try to under trying to understand you know, how P53 uh, converts a, a, a normal, perhaps preneoplastic cell into something that becomes a very aggressive cell. So mutations in P53 are very common and these mutations lead to very aggressive tumor types. And right. so we've developed some of the animal models that allow us to examine okay. the functions of P53 in vivo. Right, and um, so P53, if you give us a bit of background about that, it's a, it's a, a, a tetramer, right? The yes, the yes, P53 factor. is fascinating. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a tetramer, yeah. it uh, binds directly to DNA and it activates, it activates transcription of probably several hundred genes. It's pretty amazing. Um, and to different levels. Um, and there's also a lot of uh, tissue specificity. So in, in some tissues, for example, P53 activity will ac activate the P21 uh, cell cycle inhibitor 200 fold right. and wow. just two fold in another. So there's yeah. still a lot to learn about its function as a transcription factor. Mm -hmm. But the, the fascinating part about P53 is the kinds of mutations that occur in human cancers. And those mutations are all in the DNA binding domain. Right. So basically they disrupt the ability to function as a transcription factor. Okay. So these mutations can be, so they could be loss of function and gain of function, yes. is that right? Or yes. So uh, there's a few mutations that are truncating mutations, mm -hmm. but most of the mutations are uh, missense mutations. Um, about the last, it depends on which tumor type you're looking right. at, but 70 to 80 percent of the mutations are really missense mutations. Okay. And so there were years ago, there was a lot of talk about those missense mutations and why it was so common to have a P53 mutation. You know, one idea was maybe it was it, maybe it was the genomic region. It was very easy to make a missense mutation, but the real reason, I think, is because these mutant P53 proteins give the cell a growth advantage. Right. And right. so the cell becomes able to cope with uh, other changes and, and to mm -hmm. evolve much more quickly mm -hmm. when it has a missense mutation versus no P53 protein. Right. And so do you see these mutations in specific types of cancer, or is it very broad? And It's very broad. Right. Um, there are five hotspots. Mm -hmm. They're all arginines, which is kind of fun. <laughs> Four of those arginines directly contact the DNA, so they make sense right. why those are common um, mutations. The other hotspot is a, um, basically disrupts the whole structure of the DNA binding domain, so that's why it's a hotspot. Yeah. Um, there is a little bit of differences in different tissues, but not enough for us to really know if there are some differences between the kinds of mutations. There is some evidence in the mouse models and some evidence in um, unpublished data that's still kind of, you know, we're still working on it. Um, but we've been able to mimic these mutations in the mouse mm -hmm. and, and we're beginning to see some subtle differences. And so I just right. think that the models are going to be able to right. tell us if there is a uh, difference in how these mutations lead to aggressive breast tumors or lung tumors. Or right. So, yeah, so that's an interesting question, right? So is the the P53 mutation, is this to, more to do with initiation versus uh, sort of tumor progression or? Oh, that's you know? a fascinating <laughs> question because one of my slides tomorrow, um, in ovarian cancer, it's definitely the first mutation that happens. Right. It is very, very early. Um, and in fact, it's about 95% of high grade serious ovarian cancer that has P53 mutations. And some of the clinicians that I've talked to suggest that it's really 100% and that few percent is just misdiagnosed tumors. Right. So they, the, the clinicians think it's 100% mutation. Very early event in ovarian. But then if you look at colorectal cancer, it's the last event. And it's really what takes the uh, lesion from uh, staying in the colon to becoming a metastatic lesion. Right. So two very different scenarios. Yeah. Um, yeah. In both cases, 
once that P53 is mutant, and on top of that it has to become a stable mutant P53 um, via numerous signals that the tumor sends out, um, then it becomes a very aggressive cancer. So timing is important, yeah. but it varies between the different right. cancers. So do you think it has different, are there different mechanisms involved depending on whether the mutation happens early or late? Or? So, yes, so there's, I think your question, there's two kind of answers to your question. Right. Number one is what happens upstream. Yeah. Okay. And so from some of the studies in the animal models, what we know is that a mutant P53 protein is not a very stable protein in contrast to what we thought for years, okay? But what happens is in most tumors, there are some signals, either stress signals, inflammatory signals, that lead to a stable mutant protein, okay? And once you have a stable mutant protein, you will have these uh, additional activities, this more aggressive cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's really a two-step process. It's stabilizing that mutant protein. Uh, and perhaps those are the signals that make the mutation because the, the cell is stressed and it has to, right. in order to proliferate, it has to mutate P53. Yeah. And then the second part of that is these mutant proteins and what do they do after they become stable. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole slew of proteins that these mutant proteins bind, mutant P53 protein binds to. Um, a lot of those proteins are transcription factors. Right. So what's happening in those cases is this mutant P53, which is a very potent transcriptional activation domain, is being dragged to other promoters and is allowing gene expression of things that the cell would never see. So the question I think that you were alluding to is who does mutant P53 interact with? Yeah. And it's going to be different in different tissues. It's going to be different depending on who, what else is right. altered in the cell. Yeah. And so those are still questions that the field is grappling yeah. with. Yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of the, the processes that are regulated by mutant P53, I think there's a whole slew of different things like metabolism and DNA damage responses would be the traditional thing that P53 is associated with. Them. Yes. So, so wild type or mutant? <laughs> <laughs> Mutant P53 is doing a lot of things. There's, yeah. um, uh, Carol Purvis published some pretty uh, studies that it affects the sterile synthesis pathway. The studies are gorgeous and what it you know, all means physiologically, we still have to figure out. Mm. It affects integrin recycling. This is work from Karen Bowston's lab, vitamin D receptor, and, right. you know. Yeah. And so, so it, I, I think right now the field knows that there's a lot of things that P53 does and I think we need to move from the tissue culture systems where most of these assays have been done to the real in vivo systems right. to, to actually ask which mutants and which targets mm. and which pathways. You know, I think one of the things that I took home so far from this meeting is that um, maybe we shouldn't be looking at markers, specific genes as markers for evolution of tumors, but we should be looking at biological processes, pathways, stress right. signals. Yeah. And so we're not putting all our hopes into a single gene mm. or gene product mm. to, to, to uh, characterize the cancer, but we're really trying to understand the biology of right. that. Yeah. cancer and how it evolved and where it got to where it is. Yeah. So P53 for sure has a role. <laughs> um, I think we still have to figure out yeah. exactly how that role is. Right, okay. I think right now all we really know is that if it's a stable mutant P53 protein, it's a much more aggressive tumor. Right. So in terms of aggressive, I think um, we were speaking earlier about P53 being associated with metastasis. Yes, and, it and, is. Um, um, yeah. Promoting that sort of things. What are the kind of where are we at with understanding that process? Yes, so uh, great question. Um, the models that Tyler Jackson, my lab, made a number of years ago now basically said that um, when the cell has a mutant P53 protein expressed at high levels, it's going to lead to a higher metastatic uh, process. And we're beginning to understand that evolution. Um, the problem with the models that we currently have is either P53 is mutant everywhere in the mouse. Right. Okay, yeah. so you can't mouse develops spontaneously all kinds of tumors mm. and so you it's very difficult to say I'm going to study breast cancer because you get lymphomas you get sarcomas you get so just one model will give you so many different kinds of cancers mm. um, the other model um, is a model that um, starts out null for p53 so the whole mouse is heterozygous for p53 and then you can have a p53 mutation in a single cell or single organ or whatever 
Um, that helps a little bit because now the mutation is only in a single cell type, but the immune system, the stroma, is all heterozygous for P53. Right. And there's quite a bit of data out there that says that stroma does affect how the tumor develops. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so one of the new alleles that we've just made that I'll be presenting tomorrow is one in which we can make a mutant P53 basically in one single cell surrounded by a completely normal stroma right. in the immune system. Wow. So um, what that allows us to do is a whole bunch of things, I think. <laughs> We're still early stages, but um, so you can make a mutation in a single cell. Um, we've actually done this, and we're be just beginning to get some tumors, like two right. years later. Okay. So it's it, wow. they're not. <laughs> that's a, that's this project isn't for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> but the the first question there, which we weren't even sure we were going to get a tumor because right. we were making a P53 mutation in a very small number of cells. Yeah. And so what if we needed to hit, you know, 10 million cells before we can get a mutation? Mm -hmm. So so we're we're we're. We're into territory that's really uncharted right. at the moment. Um, the other kinds of things that we're doing with this mutation is when we make the mutation in the cell, it's a cremated recombination uh, process. And so what we do is we use these fluorescent alleles. So at the time that you make a P53 mutation, you can label your cell red fluorescent. Right. So now you can follow circulating tumor cells. Right. Yeah. Now you can actually see a, a tiny little net. Um, we're hoping we don't know yet, but we're hoping that you know we can uh, observe a dormancy. Really? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's still early, but yeah. I think it's the first time that we've been able to label a mutant P53 cell in a completely normal environment. Right. So I'm really excited about yeah. the studies. Yeah. Well. So you mentioned you could you could extract circulating tumor cells mm -hmm. from these mice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's yeah. a really unusual yes. Um, ability. Yes, it's a very small number. <laughs> yeah, of course. But they're yeah. there. Yeah. They're there in some of these models. Fantastic. And so so I think, you know, comparison of the primary versus what's circulating versus what, you know, um, targets the, mm. the bone or the liver or whatever is gonna be a really good comparison. Yeah. Yeah. You know, metastasis is such a complicated process. Absolutely. And you know, mm. we've learned so much from our tissue culture systems, but I think we need to take that next step and go to the physiological systems where we're actually um, looking at the entire process in, right. in, in the whole organism. Right. And of course, the tumor microenvironment is extraordinarily important for metastasis. Right. As we've heard today or earlier at the, at the meeting. Um, what do we know about P53's role in, in the stroma? So, um, there's one study a number of years ago uh, by Terry Van Dyke published in Cell that looked at uh, prostate, the development of uh, prostate cancer. And in her model, um, because of the alleles that we had at the time, her stroma was P53 heterozygous. Right. Okay, and I guess the stroma and the tumors interact, and that tumor evolved very rapidly. But what was happening in the stroma was the stroma was losing that other P53 allele mm -hmm. in, in order for the tumor to, I guess, get nutrients or something from the stroma. So anyway, that, that to me is um, one of the best scenarios that shows that what's happening with regards to P53, with what's happening in the stroma is affecting how to happen, how, right. what happens in the tumor. Yeah. So some of the experiments we're playing with right now, but again, you know, it takes a long time to do all yeah, these things, cool. and we first had to characterize the model to make yeah. sure it worked. You know, we can take out P53 just in the stroma. Right, and, okay. And look at like a whip tumor in the breast or something and yeah. see how the interactions see are. The yeah. yeah, yeah. Amazing, it's fascinating. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I mean, the mouse models are just, Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess I started in the field because I you know, went to um, interview for a postdoc in uh, Arnie Levine, and he said, "Oh, we can manipulate the mouse and make a tumor model." And I go, "You can? How exciting is that?" You know, and that's what really drew me to the field that you could make a point mutation in the mouse and then yeah. study the effects of that mutation. Right. And now with the new CRISPR technologies, I mean, we can just yeah. do so much more. Yeah. So it's Absolutely. really exciting. Yeah. Very exciting. So of course P53 is part of a family of proteins Correct. and um, uh, they're also mutated in cancer. So the two other P53 family members are P63 and P73 mm -hmm. and there are very few mutations in those proteins in, um, in cancers. Right. Um, P63, I'm convinced, has a role in uh, epithelial cancers right. but it's usually down modulated. 
Um, P73, I think the data, there's some data that it's also downmodulated, but it's not, it's nowhere near no, the, the, the like level P53. of P53. No. And so I do think they have a role, but I think it's probably a, a minor role. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So what do you see, uh, obviously we've spoken about some of the kind of future things that you're uh, working on. What would be the sort of other kind of key challenges uh, for the field? So the other data that's recently been published by Jutta Molslev is that um, the lymphomas that she was studying, again in an animal model, are addicted to having a mutant P53. So right. if you take out that mutant P53, the tumor basically can't deal with it. Um, so I think that's one direction that the field has to go in because it's, I mean, if you have like an oncogene overexpressed or a tyrosine kinase expressed at high levels, you know, these drugs, they're drugs that are aimed at inhibiting those activities. But right. here, you have to reactivate P53. I mean, you have to put P53 back into the system. <laughs> and so it's hard. How yeah. do you do that? Yeah. Um, and so if, if Utah's results turn out to be... Um, more broadly applicable to other kinds of cancers, then maybe we should be thinking about drugs that disrupt mutant P53 interactions with other proteins that right. affect this metastatic. Right. And I think that would be a really interesting mm -hmm. way of, of looking at it. I mean, we're not going to cure cancer, <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully we can make it a um, you know a stable disease yeah. where the, the, you know we can understand enough about what the tumor wants or requires to grow that it can be kind of just stuck there in its little environment yeah. and not growing. So I think that I think we need to think a little bit more broadly about how to to, to target P53. Yeah. Um, there are some inhibitors in the clinic right now um, that disrupt the interaction between P53 and an important regulator called MDM2. Right. Yeah. So MDM2 is an E3 ligase that targets mm. P53 for degradation, and in um, most tumors you'll have P53 mutations, but in other tumors you'll have amplification of this inhibitor right. at very high levels. And so those in, uh, inhibitors have been around for a long time. Some are in clinical studies and with mixed results right now. And mm. I think, I mean, I think you can disrupt the interaction, but I think what you've got to do as well is keep those two proteins apart and I think what the drugs are doing is just creating a, a maybe a seesaw effect where P53 right. isn't constantly on and so you can't yeah. you can't uh, we need to tip the balance yes yeah we need to tip the balance yeah. it's absolutely right <laughs> excellent well thank you very much okay well I enjoyed talking to you <laughs> thank you for interviewing me <laughs> great thank okay you. thank you